Welcome back. This is Larry Benko, call sign W0QE. And this video is about modeling a ballon in SimSmith. Ballons are a very common component used in amateur radio and RF design. And they serve a number of purposes. Many are used to control common mode currents. Some are used to connect an unbalanced source to a balanced load. They all do basically the same thing, and they're all built similarly, although there are numerous different configurations of them. To try to understand how ballon works and how we can model it, I've taken a ballon here that I've built, shown in this picture. It is a nine-turn ballon wound with RG316 Teflon coax, which is coax that's about a tenth of an inch outside diameter, nine turns on an FT114A-61 core. The core is 1.14 inches in diameter. It's made out of 61 material, which is mu of 125. I've got a little plug in, little uh, polyethylene plug I put in the middle to keep the turns from moving around, and a little rubber spacer at the bottom to keep the output turn and the input turn from getting too close together. They're shown plugged into a little network analyzer. The little network analyzer has been calibrated to a reference plane right here at the top of these little screw terminals. And the leads are very short. So we drive the one side of the ballon, for driving source and ground right here. We drive this side right here. The load side comes down here, and you can't really see this, but it's expanded right over here. It's comprised of a couple resistors in parallel, two, 50 ohm, two approximately 49.9 ohm resistors, basically 50 ohms, two 50 ohm resistors in parallel, and two more in parallel. So we have 25 ohms plus 25 ohms, which is 50 ohms total across the output. This coax is 50 ohm coax. And we have three points here that we can solder something to them if we wish and connect to ground. We can either connect nothing here. We can, in this case, there's a 100 picofarad capacitor uh, connected here. And this will be the basis for our test. We will build a circuit in SimSmith and see how closely it matches what I measure. This circuit will probably take a little bit of explanation to, to understand. But what I intended to do here was to take a piece of transmission line that is wound around a core and make this appear to be instrumented in such a way that I can look at the currents and voltages at every possible place in the circuit. And to do that, a couple things were done. A piece of transmission line was put in the middle here. It has length LEN, characteristic impedance or surge impedance of Z0, velocity factor VF, no loss. The loss really doesn't have anything to do with how this circuit matches or, or how it works. And it has four resistors out here, the current of which can be measured in all these resistances. They're one micro ohm, so they do not affect the circuit appreciably. It has four points, W1 through W4, where voltages can be measured, or voltages between two points can be measured. And it has a choking impedance across both sides of the transmission line. Generally, when you see the, a transmission line simulated with choking impedance, it's put across one side of the transmission line only. And people kind of dismiss the fact that you would get the same answer or wouldn't get the same answer if you did it across one side or the other side or both sides. If I do it across one side, I put a value in of just one times the value. If I put it across both sides, I do two times the value. I drew this with, with two times the value. We're going to see how well that works. Additionally, there's a load out here. The load is a resistance R sub T total and a midpoint that I can move up and down based on this, this, this parameter right here. And so one side is RT minus RX. The other side is RX only. There's a line down here, which I've shown before, but basically it keeps this within bounds. So if I try to take this below zero down here, the circuit continues to set it to zero. And if I try to take it to a value above R sub T, it keeps setting it back to R sub T. That's all this does. 
then I have a whole bunch of plotting that can be done. Plotting is kind of an interesting thing in SimSmith. It's a very powerful feature. I didn't use it initially, and I continued to, continued to use LT Spice for a while when SimSmith first got the plotting features. And I never really liked the way SimSmith could display phase because it displayed it as a complex number, which was easy enough to understand mathematically, but intuitively it didn't it didn't sit real well. Later on, Sim Smith came out with a function called Wave, which is a really nice feature. It actually turns the square chart here into an oscilloscope, where phase is not displayable in terms of a, a number, but it's displayable in terms of visually. So it works really well. What we've got here on a square chart right now is watts displayed and SWR. They display with the, with the typical frequency horizontal axis you always would expect. And in this case, um, I've got a circuit here which doesn't actually use, transmit any power to, the, to the, this port. So it doesn't matter what the load impedance is out here. It has no effect on the circuit. All the load is inside. Consequently, I made a, made, a pram, made a command I call P0, which adds the power in R5 and adds the power in R6, and that's the power in the load. And that can be plotted right here, and that's what I'm plotting up on the top. I've got a 100-watt generator with an internal matching network in it so that if this gives some SWR, I still get 100 watts into my circuit at all times. Anytime this line drops below 100 watts, that's power lost in the ballon. And I've got a section here that looks at voltages. I can look at the input voltage, which is the W1 to W2 differential voltage. Differential voltage here is the output voltage. Common mode voltage on the top side is this voltage. Bottom side is this voltage. I can calculate all those. I can calculate a voltage here to ground and a voltage here to ground, which I've done right here. And I can calculate a midpoint voltage right here. Now I did the midpoint voltage a little different than these. It turns out if you don't, if you want to connect, um, calculate a voltage to ground, and you can exp explicitly say it if there's a, if there's a ground point on the circuit. So effectively here I'm doing from W3 to the label ground. If I leave that second point off, it's calculated in reference to this point, the bottom side of P2, which is what this one does. And I just left it on off. I did this one the other way. This is probably a better construct because it makes you, forces you to remember what you're really doing. Current works a little differently. You don't have to worry about that. But you do have to worry about the phase dots on the resistors because that's the way current is, is defined to be. They're all in line here, so it's, everything's okay. I'm looking into current R1 through R9. So I can look at every single current that takes place here in this circuit. R8 and R9, while they show as resistors, they're actually complex numbers, uh, complex impedances. And that works just fine in SimSmith. I could make this a file if I want this to be a file, if I had measured the com, um, common mode impedance of my choke. And this is pretty much how the circuit works. So now let's use the circuit. And if we look at the circuit from for a moment, right now we've got the, let's set this point to be the midpoint. The midpoint, if I tie this point to ground, and if the, the ballon is good enough that no current flows through this path, there'll be equal currents here on each of these two resistors. Equal current on these two resistors will give me equal voltages out here. Equal voltages out here is exactly what you would expect if you had a true balanced load to drive. So this would simulate a balanced load. Now, this circuit does not have enough choking impedance to reduce this current to zero, but let's see what happens. So let's measure the current through I5 and I6, which are the load, and we see they're a little bit different. And then let's measure the current through I7, which I've labeled as IG, which is the current to ground, and we see that it has a value which is pretty significant. So the the load current here, the one resistor is 2.03 amps, 1.97 amps, roughly 2 amps average, and this is 0.2 amps. This is 10% of what these values are. 
Historically, people have talked about a ballon as being good when the differential currents are reduced to more than 10% um, of a difference. Sometimes I've heard people make comments like when the, 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 cur the common mode current is 10% or less than the differential current, that's a good ballon. Well, in this case, the, the common mode current, which is the current that goes to the ground here, is 10% of the differential currents. And it's interesting because that occurs with a reactance of 250 ohms. And I'm sure there's been several issues of the handbook that mention impedances of a ballon wanting to be in the order of five times uh, 50 ohms or 250 ohms. So this number comes about from, from those, kinds of, those kinds of places. Of course, if we raise the impedance here, we will see this circuit become better. No, no surprise there. If we raise it enough and we actually change the sign of it, it becomes capacitive. It's still a good ballon. These currents are very, very good, very, very equal still. As we reduce its value, but still keep it capacitive, we start to see the ballon gets worse. This is operating it past the resonant point, a long ways past the resonant point. So we see that the ballon will work very nicely up through resonance, past resonance, and pretty much uh, we can measure these. We can measure these currents and see what see what the effects are. We we can also put a resistance in here just to see what happens. If we put a resistance in here, watch the power watch the power curve. It'll drop down. That means there's some power being produced in the or being consumed in the uh, in the ballon. And as we make Let's drop this down. Let's put let's make all of our power be all of our impedance be in the ballon. And all the power, oh, excuse me, all the impedance in the ballon being in the resistor. We see now that with 100 ohms input, we basically have about f f almost 5 watts lost in the ballon. Resistance is not our friend always in a transmitting ballon. Resistance can get in the way and, and cause too much heat in the ballon. Fortunately, uh, most of these ballons that are operated with, with reasonably good ferrite material, and, and when I say reasonably good, I mean ferrite material that's not a real high permeability, but a lower permeability, you usually don't have a problem with that. If you start winding a core on like 31 material, 43 material, and using it at higher frequencies, you'll see the resistance comes up too quickly, and in a transmitting application, sometimes you can get into heat problems with the ballon. So we, ha we have a way here to be able to change the choking impedance. We can change the length of the transmission line, and we can see what, what the effect of SWR is. It's kind of interesting. It's a repeating pattern. But let's look a little bit more at the transmission line. What makes the transmission line special in this case? And the transmission line in, in SimSmith is... There's the two currents going into the transmission line. They're equal and out of phase. That's what you'd expect the transmission line to have. This is the current, uh, this is the I1, uh, the current through R1, and this is the current through R2, down here, equal and out of phase at all, at all times. You would expect the current coming out of the ballon to be equal and out of phase too. And it is. It's delayed a little bit, but it's equal and out of phase. Now, a person who would look at this ballon. Oh, by the way, the output currents would not equal the input currents if there was loss in the ballon, but they would still be equal, but they'd be equal and out of phase, but they wouldn't be equal in amplitude to these two currents. If you were to think about this circuit for a minute, you might think that the voltage from W1 to W3 should be the same as from W2 to W4. Let's see if that's really the case or not. So W1 to W3 was what I called the top side common mode voltage and W and W2 to W4 is the uh, common mode voltage on the bottom side. They are not equal. Is there anything we can do to mess around with the, the tap point here to see if we can make them equal? Does not appear to be the case. No matter what we do, those two voltages are not equal. 
Matter of fact, if we drive this all the way down to the bottom, it becomes pretty obvious that the, uh, the voltage here across here is zero because this point and this point are connected together. So the common mode voltage on the two windings in the choke is not the same. One side is different than the other side, which is kind of an interesting concept, but that's exactly how it works. In order to try to figure out which is the right way to model the transmission line, let's look at enough instrumentation to see if there's much of a difference with the different configurations, but not so much that we lose track of things. Looking at the common mode voltage on the top and the bottom of the transmission line seemed like a good thing to look at. Looking at the current flowing to ground out here seems like a good thing to look at. And looking at the currents in the two load, two load resistances look like a good thing to look at too. Everything else, let's just say, doesn't matter for the moment. So right now, we have a circuit here that shows pretty good match between the currents and the resistors. And it has a, a ground current that's roughly one-tenth of what the, these, these are. It has a voltage on the top side, common mode voltage of 54 volts, basically. And on the bottom side, of 49 volts. Now, if we take this connection down here and remove it and change this to 1 times the value, we see the circuit has changed somewhat. Not a lot, but a little bit. Our values here are pretty much the same as they were before, roughly around two amps, and they're about one point, you know, a little bit above and a little bit below. This may show it a little bit, a little bit higher than it was before. This value is a little bit higher than it was before, very little. This 54 volt number now is 52 volts. This 49 volt number is 48 volts. Not a lot of difference. Let's go and, and get and, and do it this way now instead. And what do we see? Well, this gives us a little better balance between the two of these and a slightly lower value, I believe, of the, of the common mode current. Not much. This is pretty much the same. The, the, the differential voltage on the top side is a little bit higher than originally. It was 54. It went to 52, and now it's 56, basically. And this was 49. went to 48. Now it's 50. I would say that either both of these two circuits are pretty darn close to being the same circuit. Which would make you feel pretty good. So now the next thing we're going to do is we're going to take this circuit and we're going to move it down to the bottom here. That moved the tap all the way down to the bottom. So we effectively have zero ohms here. We have 50 ohms here. We still have our 100 watts out. And what we see is our currents are still, this one's 2 amps. 1.95 amps, and this is 0.05. So this is 53 milliamps. 53 milliamps, these are balanced well. Our common mode voltage on the bottom side is zero, as you would expect it would be. Our common mode voltage on the, mode voltage on the top side is 20, 26 and a half volts. Now this obviously begs a point here, and that is if these two are connected together, what the heck does this even matter? I mean, we're connecting an impedance across a short. Well, that shouldn't do anything, so let's disconnect this and see what happens. The answer is absolutely nothing. So even though we had some of the impedance um, applied here, it wasn't used. What ha So, Yet, if we were modeling this with just an impedance on the top side, we would have set this to a value of 1, of 1 here. And if we do that, what we see is this 53 milliamp number rises to 100, 103 milliamps. 
this two amp number became this 1.89 from 1.95 this current rises I don't know which one of these is the correct value to use or not or not um, this value before was 27 it's 26 volts now that's not a big difference but it's pretty obvious that these two models so far have not been the same. What about in this case? In this case, I don't think it matters what we have down here. We can have zero times it, 100 times it. Remember, it's across a, it's across a short. If we put, model all the impedance down here, we end up with a perfect ballon. A perfect ballon has both the currents identically on top of each other. It has the common mode voltage on the top side be, being 20... A little bit above 27 volts and the common common mode voltage on the bottom being zero so it's pretty obvious that these two circuits three circuits top bottom and both are not really equal now which one which one is most important we came to the conclusion in the middle case where the resistance was 25 ohms here all three of them were pretty pretty much alike and the extremes, we shorted out one of these, and it had no effect. Um, we could take this circuit up to the top and do this again, and we'd find out that they were different also. But normally when we use this circuit, we expect it to be used somewhere where this point is not tapped at the bottom or the top. So I kind of like the idea of having the impedance on both sides but I couldn't, I'd be hard pressed to have to prove that to anybody that that's really a better way of doing it. Now let's see how well our simulated results match my measured results. I've changed the circuit somewhat for one primary reason that's there's too much messing around every time I change something and I keep making mistakes. So I've tried to automate it. What I'm gonna do here is I have a file that I will load which is the measured results for a test con con uh, condition. And I will have a control block here which adjusts these three blocks based on those, those conditions such that this will model, this will synthesize having the choking impedance on top of the transmission line, on, bottom of the, on the bottom of the transmission line, and on both sides of the transmission line. The control block here may appear to be fairly complex, but it's not. Uh, these top lines right here do nothing more than allow me to have a variable that runs between zero and four. If I try to make it less than zero, it gets jammed to zero. If I try to make it greater than four, it gets jammed to four. And it sets the values of some of these resistors. These resistors are all set with values of either zero or one gig ohm. And effectively, they become a, a bunch of switches. And then down here, these commands seed the values in these circuits so that I only have to enter them one time. I've adjusted the length of my trans transmission line to be 2.04 feet. My transmission line that I used in my, my winding was actually 1.416 feet long with a velocity factor of 0.695. These models have velocity factor of one. So I adjusted the length to be 2.04 effective feet. 50 ohm transmission line, 50 ohm load. And let's go through these switches real quickly. If the switch is, if the switch is zero, all the resistors are open. That's like this circuit being not connected to anything. If the switch is one, the top Resistor and the bypass resistor. Top and bypass are connected together, and that's the connection from the top side to ground. If the switch position is two, the center here is connected to zero ohms. Zero ohms down here, so it's the center is connected to ground. Position three, the bottom's connected to ground. And in position four, we're back to the middle point connected, but this resistor is not a short anymore, it's an open, so we, it's a middle point is connected to 100 picofarads to ground. And that's done for a specific reason uh, that'll, that'll become um, obvious in just a moment. So let's go back here to the first case, which 
I want to do, which is the which is the top connected to ground. The file we're going to load here, it's already loaded, is the center conductor of the coax. The center conductor is the top side, the bottom side is the shield. The center conductor of the coax connected to ground. And that was already loaded. And since all three of these are almost identical, I can dispense with probably two of them. Just remember that it's labeled top. Top is the black one, both is the is the blue one, and, and the bottom is, is the green one. One, one quick thing, the file, the, the file that is put in here was the file that I actually measured um, as the choking impedance. And when I put it on both sides of the transmission line, I multiplied it by two because they're two in parallel. So here we come, come up with, let's zoom out again. Um, in this case, I'd say all four of these curves are pretty darn close together on a Smith chart. We have the orange curve is the measured result. The black is with the choking impedance being on the top side of the transmission line. The blue is on both sides. The green is on the bottom. The green matches a little bit better than the, than the others, but they are all so close it's pretty ridiculous. What we see up here is the SWR at 1.8 megahertz. I didn't quite hit, the, hit that exactly right on, but... Nah, I still didn't. Anyways, about 1 point, uh, 1 1.8 megahertz, we see an SWR of a ball about 1.4 to 1. And that's due to the fact that the choking impedance was somewhere in the order of like 12 and a half microhenries, which wasn't enough for 160 meters on its own. But we got good agreement. And now this, this is an agreement based on an impedance looking in versus the modeling versus the measured. This does not tell you how well the choke, the cho uh, how well the currents were balanced in the, in the resistors and the load. That would have been a little too difficult to measure. But it's kind of interesting. If the SWR matches exactly, pretty much the rest of the circuit probably matches pretty closely. So it gives you a good confidence that that's a good thing, that, that this is a good thing. So I'd, I'd give this a check mark for all the different modeling types as being perfectly acceptable. The next thing let's do, uh, let's come over here and let's look at the circuit with the halfway point connected to ground. We'll load that file. And now I need to go over here and I need to set this to be the halfway point connected to ground. And that was right there. Now, again, zooming out, we see everything looking like it's pretty much in the same place. Although my measured results deviate a little bit from the, the three predicted ones, they're all still pretty close. All three predicted, all three predicted ones from the top, um, both and bottom, were almost identical again. And my measured one, I don't know, it, it deviates a little bit. That's just the way it is. Again, I would say all these are pretty darn close. This is an SWR out here of only 1.05 to 1, less than that at 50 megahertz. So it's not exactly uh, like we're way off or anything. Uh, the next one let's do is let's tie the shield to ground. And that represents that case. Whoops. Represents that case. And we see that the measured value is considerably different than these others. But again, when we zoom out, it looks pretty darn close. They all met, they all give me a pretty good indication of a, of a, of a good match. <clears throat> the next one let's do is I have a 25 ohm load that had no connections to it at all. And for that, I need to simulate a 25 ohm resistor. And I need to set the configuration to where nothing's connected. There it is. And now we're, there we are. And over here, I only see two graphs. Let's see, that one, they all line up on top of each other. So all three, all three, all three of the predictions are pretty darn close to what I measured. The length is right, the right amount of rotation. They're, they're off a little bit, you know, this is not an exact science getting these things to match. But again, you'd have to agree that this is pretty darn close. So, so far I'd say all of them are, all of them are doing pretty well. And I've got one more to do here. We need to go back to 50 ohms here. 
and we'll load the file where we have the halfway point connected to a 100 picofarad capacitor. And then I'll go over here and we'll set this to be... Okay. So in this case, what I see is kind of some ugliness. And, what, and the problem I've got is I've, I'm synthesizing more points here in my, than I actually measured. I didn't measure enough points. We can say that this sort of matches this, this circuit, but I did a, let me close this off right now. What I did was I made another, I measured another file with more points. But to keep from taking forever to make the measurement, I only, I only measured it over three to six megahertz. So let's just look at it. I'm gonna get errors here on frequencies being out of, out of whack. And this one's still going to be out of whack, so let me put this one in the range too. Now the range, okay, now everything's okay. So I'm only looking from 3 to 6 megahertz, but what I see is this very interesting rotation here. Um, and all three of them, again, match pretty closely. In this case, the, the one on the ground side probably matches closer, well, yeah, it probably matches a little closer. I don't know, the ground or the, or the or the one with both sides match closer. Um, it, but again, on a, mac, you know, on a macro scale here, they all match pretty close. And this is kind of an interesting, interesting thing here. What we have going on, <coughs> you can see my, the match. We, there is actually a, a blip in the SWR. If you tie the center of this ballon if you tie the center of this center point of this ballon to 100 picofarad to ground, there is actually a blip of the S in, in the SWR you see rise at about 4.4, little above 4.4 megahertz. That actually exists, and that's due to the the reactance of the choking impedance and that and that capacitance. And here's a case where resistance would help you uh, if there was some resistance in the circuit, but. Um, Nevertheless, that does exist. Now, whether or not you'd ever run into a case like this, it does exist. The modeling shows it. I have to take away um, from this example so much so far, um, as the all three of these model pretty well. You know, they're not they're not perfect, but they model pretty pretty nicely. I still kind of like the case where, where I'm using both. And maybe that's just because just I'm kind of a symmetrical type of a person. Maybe not, but um, I don't see any reason to use one over the other one. Uh, they all have a fault whenever you be begin to get near the boundary conditions where you tie one side of the ballon to ground or the other side to, to ground. They all have weaknesses there. But somewhere in the middle, they seem to do a pretty good job. Now, this is not an end all to this problem because balance are often wound with trifiler windings or quadrifiler windings. And SimSmith has no mechanism to be able to deal with those at the moment. Sometimes we build circuits with flux transformers. And if we build them with flux transformers, we have to be careful about the delays. Uh, if we build them a transmission transformer, type circuits, the delays get built in so we know the frequency response is nice. If you build it with a flux type transformer, you have to be very, very careful that you have to, to somehow account for the delays or you won't uh, synthesize the circuit properly. And that's one of the weaknesses in a, in a tr uh, circuit built that way. It generally does not have nearly the same bandwidth. The transmission line transformers have much better bandwidth because you're adding things that have equal delays um, when you want to build a other than a one-to-one -one type ballon. But nevertheless, this represents, uh, this was an interesting experiment. I hope uh, people find it interesting. I'd like to encourage anybody who likes these videos to subscribe and um, feel free to make comments and feel free to tell me if I did something wrong. You know how to do it better than me. I'd be perfectly um, amicable to redoing a video on, on what I did wrong. And if you have better, some better suggestions, I'd appreciate those also. Thanks again, and I've enjoyed it.